Everyone has their own opinion regarding who they believe to be the most dangerous person in the world. However, we will go one step further and provide you with a list that can be considered definite. Please give yourself a moment to consider the most dangerous individual that comes to mind. Imagine there are 20 persons like that, each hailing from a different country and with a unique story, but all of whom have left an everlasting impression on the world as a result of their involvement in violent acts. When, when he, he drank, he was almost like a different person. Causing trouble for any of the 20 people listed below will make life unbearable for the person in question. So please use extreme caution if you plan to test the patience of these individuals. Here are 20 most dangerous people in the world. World. Number 20. Bryce Rhodes The trial of Bryce Rhodes, charged with three counts of murder, was again postponed after his defense attorneys requested a competency evaluation. They asserted that Rhodes suffered from an intellectual disability that would prevent prosecutors from seeking the death penalty in Rhodes' case. As the case has been pending since 2016 and Rhodes' actions in court have repeatedly been irrational, the judge of the Jefferson Circuit Court, Charles Cunningham, questioned why defense attorneys hadn't made the motion in previous years. If Rhodes' actions in court continue to be irrational, the case could be postponed until 2023. Jones Brown has expressed his growing dissatisfaction with the judge's decision to permit Rhodes' behavior and has requested that the judge be held in contempt. Christopher Jones is said to have been shot by Rhodes in May 2016. Later that month, it's believed that he murdered both Ordway and Gordon, the residents of Rhodes and Clifton, according to the statements made by the police. The charred remains of their victims were left in the Shawnee neighborhood after being thrown there. According to the accusation, Rhodes took the lives of two two brothers out of the fear that they would inform the authorities about his role in the murder of Jones. Rhodes is being detained on a full cash bond on $1 million. Before we begin, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Ted Kaczynski Ted Kaczynski is currently serving four life sentences in a maximum security facility in Colorado without the chance of parole. The Unabomber is a more popular name for him. He planned 16 explosions between 1978 and 1995, all of which resulted in the deaths of three individuals from a log cabin in the remote Montana wilderness. He was the target of the FBI's longest running and most expensive investigation. He promised to end his campaign in 1995 if his essay, The Industrial Society and Its Future, was printed in a significant newspaper. Paper. The 35,000 word essay was published in the Washington Post and New York Times, much to Kaczynski's chagrin. Throughout his trial, his defense team asserted that he was mad ostensibly to spare him the death penalty. This has worked against any serious study of his ideas up until lately, along with the horrifying nature of his actions. Many of the topics he wrote about are currently being discussed more and more as we prepare for the impending automation revolution. Currently, Kaczynski spends time collaborating on his beliefs and communicating with academics and media. Although some of the problems he identified are inconceivable today, his answers are still applicable. Number 18. Charles Manson it has been 50 years since Charles Manson's followers terrorized the country and the city of Los Angeles for two days with a two-day murderous rampage that has left seven people lost their lives. The Manson-led killings brought him and the Manson family to the forefront of the late 1960s counterculture. After being freed from prison for petty crime in 1967, the fame-hungry Manson started to form his cult. Diane Lake, a former member of the Manson family, later referred to the cult leader as a phony, a manipulator, and an opportunist. Despite her first statement that she was awestruck upon meeting him, additionally he possessed a keen sense of others' weakness and the amazing capacity to assume the identities of 100 people. Manson used drugs to influence his drug-addled followers by persuading them that a racial war was on the verge of breaking out. Because he's incarcerated alongside black males, he has preconceived notions about who they are. He views them as uncivilized. On August 9, 1969, Manson supporters assaulted the house that actress Sharon Tate and her husband, Hollywood filmmaker Roman and Polanski were renting in the seclusion of Benedict Canyon, Los Angeles. Tate, celebrity hairstylist Jay Sebring, coffee heiress Abigail Folger, author Wojciech Frykowski, and adolescent Stephen Parent, who just happened to be visiting the property's caretaker that fateful evening, were all killed by the group. Tate was stabbed 16 times while she was almost nine months pregnant. Number 17. John Wayne 
The detective who unearthed the gruesome crimes of serial killer John Wayne Gacy is forever changed by their chilling conversation. When Mr. Tovar searched the murderer's Cook County farm in 1978, he found 29 victims. Due to his propensity for dressing as one for charity events and street parties, Gacy has earned the moniker Killer Clown, according to Mr. Tovar, who spoke about his interactions with Gacy, who he claimed liked to play games with you. Gacy was the type of guy who, if he knew you knew something, was honest with you on any questions you asked him, Mr. Tovar said in a statement to The Sun Online. He would play tricks on you if you didn't find out. He had a terrifying conversation with Gacy at one point during the investigation that still bothers him today. I picked him up from the county jail and asked him, John, how many people did you kill? At that point, 45 sounds like a good number, he said, adding, well, I told my lawyer this, and you guys already know about that. The retired cop said, at that point, I asked John, where are they? And he simply said, you're the detective, as he grinned, as he looked at me. Find out for yourself, please. Number 16, Robert Charles Brown. Robert Charles Brown, an American citizen born on October 31st, 1952, is currently incarcerated in the Florida State Prison after being found guilty of two murders. In addition, Brown, a self-described serial murderer, claims to have murdered 48 people, mostly women and one man in South Vietnam while serving in the U.S. military. Even though there is little evidence to support many of Brown's allegations, if true, he would rank among the most prolific serial killers in the American history. In connection with the 13-year-old Heather Don Church's death, on September 17, 1991. Brown was detained on March 28, 1995 and charged with first-degree murder. He admitted to the murder of 15-year-old Rocio Del Pilar Sperry, who was killed on November 10, 1987, inside an apartment complex on July 27, 2006, as a part of a similar plea bargain. Sperry's corpse was never found. Seven sacred virgins entombed side by side, and the less deserving are scattered wide. The score is your one, the other team 48, the letter said. The letter also contained a hand-drawn map with numbers inside each state of Colorado, Washington, California, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Mississippi. Number 15. Jesse James in the words of the well-known ballad from the 19th century, Jesse James, the notorious Missouri criminal, was well-known across the entire country. He was daring, bad, and bold in Jesse's eyes. And Jesse James was all of those things in a certain sense. Jesse James may have participated in up to 19 robberies between 1869 and 1881, robbing banks, railways, and stagecoaches from Mississippi to West Virginia to Minnesota. As a result, nearly 20 individuals passed away, including seven of Jesse's accomplices but the heinous robberies persisted as a result of the repeated failures of law police and private investigators to apprehend Jesse and his gang. Missouri came to be known as the robber state. But long before the mythical Jesse of song, dime novels, and movies, there was a blue-eyed child, the son of a Baptist preacher and a loving mother, growing up in a country torn apart over slavery and conflicting loyalties. All in all, Jesse grew up to be a man that, when you see him, you have to hold your purse well with a strong fist and feet if you want to go alive. Are you prepared to meet Jesse? Tell us in the comment section below. Number 14. Jeffrey Dahmer American serial killer and sex offender Jeffrey Dahmer was born on May 21, 1960. Dahmer committed 17 horrible male murders between the years 1978 and 1991. His method of operation included cannibalism, necrophilia, rape, and dismemberment. According to most accounts, Dahmer had a typical upbringing. Nevertheless, as he grew older, he withdrew and stopped communicating. As he neared puberty, he showed little to no interest in hobbies or social interaction, instead turning to exploring animal carcasses and binge drinking. He continued to drink throughout high school, but it did not prevent him from earning his 1978 diploma. The 18-year-old committed his first murder just three weeks later. That summer, as his parents' divorce proceeded, Jeffrey was left alone in the home. He took the chance to put the sinister ideas that had been developing in his head into action. He volunteered to take Stephen Hicks, a hitchhiker he had picked up, back to his father's place so he could drink beer. Dahmer whacked Hicks in the back of the head with a 10-pound dumbbell when he decided to depart. Dahmer eventually admitted to killing Hicks only because he wanted Hicks to stay after dissecting, dissolving, pulverizing, and scattering the now indiscernible remains over his backyard. Before he killed again, it would be nine years. Number 13. Timothy McVeigh 
The Oklahoma City bombing, the greatest terror assault in American history, occurred 20 years ago, when Timothy McVeigh destroyed the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building on April 19, 1995. He killed 168 people, for which he was executed on June 11, 2001. He is still the sole terrorist that the federal government has executed. The bombing left Oklahoma City permanently scarred, but the alleged attacker, along with co-conspirator Terry Nichols, was largely unaware of the suffering his actions had caused until he was put to death by lethal injection. After leaving a rental vehicle loaded with 4,800 pounds of explosives outside the building, which also housed a daycare facility with 19 children were slain, McVeigh discovered himself on execution row. Despite admitting that he was unaware of the daycare center's existence, the terrorist never expressed regret for the explosion or deaths of the children. According to a USA Today reporter who also spoke to McVeigh, that chat was one of many that took place while McVeigh was incarcerated as part of a strategy by his counsel to improve the bomber's reputation before and during the trial. When offered the chance to apologize for his conduct, McVeigh instead vented his anger onto the press. I'm not able to stop those. Don't judge your neighbor until you've walked a mile in his shoes, the proverb says. Number 12. Donald Harvey Donald Harvey had the delusional belief that he was playing the part of an angel when he committed the murders of terminally ill patients at Drake Hospital in the 1980s. Joe Dieters, the prosecutor for Hamilton County, stated that Harvey worked as a nurse's assistant and had unrestricted access to the facility. Harvey was found guilty of 37 deaths even though his attorney claimed Harvey had confessed to 57 of the murders. Cyanide, arsenic, and rat poison were the lethal poisons that Harvey used. According to a book written by Harvey's attorney, William Whalen, Harvey's attorney wrote the book. Whalen's statement before he passed asserted, the bottom line was, Donald Harvey loved to kill. Whalen asserts that Harvey was a victim of maltreatment as a youngster, that he was a target of bullying at school, that he was gay when it was socially unacceptable, and that he felt powerless throughout his life. According to Dieters, who assisted the prosecution in the case against Harvey and acted in that capacity, Harvey was the one who covertly administered the poisons into the feeding tubes. It's said that Harvey would place a skull next to a burning candle, read off a list of names, and then look into the flickering light to determine who would die. A quote attributed to Harvey reads as follows, I had to have backing from somewhere. Number 11. Alexander Pachushkin Alexander Pachushkin, a serial killer in the making, fell off a swing as a kid. The swing swung back as he sat up and struck him in the forehead. The incident permanently harmed his still-developing frontal cortex, which governs problem-solving, impulse control, and personality traits. Alexander Pachushkin killed his first victim in 1992 but didn't kill again until 2001, when he started going for victims regularly. He claimed that his objective was to murder 64 people, corresponding to the number of chessboard squares. Even though he was only found guilty of killing 49 people, he insists that he succeeded in his mission and killed so many people that he lost track. He had later asserted that the number would have continued to rise if he hadn't been stopped. According to GQ, the bulk of Pachushkin's victims were elderly homeless people who he located in Moscow's Bitevsky Park and enticed there with the promise of free vodka. He would drink with them, allowing them to consume as much as they pleased before killing them, frequently by striking them in the head with a hammer. He would insert the vodka bottles as his signature into the enormous holes into their heads. Later, he expanded and started murdering younger people, sneaking behind them and catching them off guard. He was no longer particular about who he chose as his victims, but he appeared to favor the elderly homeless guys. Number 10. Jim Jones as the command of their charismatic but paranoid leader, Jim Jones, members of the People's Temple cult from California were massacred and killed in the Jonestown Agricultural Commune of Guyana on November 18, 1978. One of the greatest mass fatalities in American history, the incident resulted in almost 900 deaths. 300 were under 17. Jones issued radio suicide instructions for temple members outside the facility after the incident. Members of the complex had previously practiced Jones' revolutionary suicide plan and in which a fruit drink was laced with cyanide, tranquilizers, and sedatives. This plan was carried out there shortly after. Adult participants ingested it after being syringe injected into the mouths of infants and kids. Jones himself was shot and passed away. Less than 100 members of the temple in Guyana managed to survive the killing. The majority either deserted that day or were in Georgetown. Later, authorities found a stash of weapons, hundreds of passports, and 500,000 US dollars. According to reports, millions more were put in 
and foreign bank accounts. Following the incident, the People's Temple effectively ceased to exist and filed for bankruptcy at the end of 1978. For his involvement on November 18th, only one man, Temple member Larry Layton, was prosecuted in the United States. He was given a life sentence after being found guilty of conspiring to kill Ryan and helping to kill the U.S. Number 9. Al Capone Al Capone is a name that almost all Romanian children know. According to Bucharest resident Kat Grapel, the American gangster whose organized crime operation dominated 1920s Chicago appeals to Romanians partly because, as the child of immigrants, he is seen as an underdog. After capitalism replaced communism in the 1990s, self-made individuals and gangsters became particularly popular in Eastern European countries. Capone is the first name that comes to mind when you think about the mafia, mob, and gangsters, says Grapel's husband, Sergio. Prunderel. In Bucharest, the two run an escape room business and based one of their rooms on Al Capone, drawing inspiration from the American television show, The Making of the Mob. The room tasks players with infiltrating a gang in 1920 Chicago. According to the couple, Capone loomed large in Romanian immigration and was the obvious choice. Almost 75 years after his death, an eclectic group of fans from casual supporters who named their pit bulls Capone to diehards who seek bathroom tiles from the Chicago hotel where Capone once stayed, continue to pursue his memory. These devotees can be found in unexpected places. In Arborg, Iceland, an annual Al Capone Day festival features costumed adults chasing each other and authentic Chicago deep dish pizza. Meanwhile, the late scholar Dear Drobert reported in her 2016 book Al Capone, his life, legacy, and legend, that postage stamps in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan featured the gangster's face. Number 8. Matteo Messina Denaro Police in The Hague, Netherlands believed they had apprehended 59-year-old Sicilian crime lord Matteo Messina Denaro when they blindfolded and brought away the 50-year-old man. Only known as Mark L., the Dutch Public Prosecutor's Office reported that Mark L., who had been present at the Grand Prix on September 5th, had since been released. Denaro was sought after for explosions in 1993 that left 10 dead and 93 injured. When officers entered the restaurant carrying a European arrest warrant issued by the Italian government, Mark L. was eating with his son. Leon Van Cleef, his attorney, stated, The situation my client is in is comparable to a nightmare or a dreadful movie. Imagine eating a meal one minute and then finding yourself in a Dutch prison with maximum security the next. Mark L. said he was an English citizen and not the person claimed by Italy, according to a representative for the public prosecutor's office. The investigation's findings were unfavorable and resulted from an expedited process. At the start of the evening, the public prosecutor ordered the defendant's immediate release. The most sought-after mafioso in Italy, Denaro, famously boasted that he could load a cemetery with his victims. He also goes by Diabolik, which he adopted after an elusive burglar in a comic book. He is seen as the rightful successor to two mafia of godfathers in prison. Number 7. The Gonzalez Sisters Delfina and Maria de Jess Gonzalez, also referred to as Las Poquianchis, were two sisters from Guanajuato, a state in northern Mexico that is 200 miles from Mexico City. Rancho El Niguel, sometimes known as the Bordello from Hell, was operated by the sisters in San Francisco del Rincón from the 1950s until the mid-1960s. Josefina Gutierrez, a procuress, was detained by the police on suspicion of abducting young girls in the Guanajuato region. When questioned, she accused the two sisters. When police examined the sisters' farm, they discovered the deaths of over 91 people, including 11 males, 80 women, and several fetuses. Investigations found that the plan was to use help-wanted advertising to find prostitutes, even though the ads would claim the girls would work as male for the two sisters. Many of the females were given cocaine or heroin under duress. When the prostitutes fell ill, suffered physical harm from frequent sex, lost their beauty, or failed to satisfy the clients, the sisters would kill them. Additionally, they would murder visitors who arrived big bearing sums of cash. One of the sisters reportedly responded, the food didn't agree with them, when asked why the people died. The Gonzalez sisters, who were tried in 1964, received a 40-year prison term. Delfina was killed in a prison accident, and Maria served her time before disappearing from view after being released. Number 6. Pedro Lopez The majority of serial murder stories have a resolution. We are left to hypothesize about the murderer's motives and mental conditions once the criminal is apprehended and the bodies are discovered. Pedro Lopez, one of South America's most known serial killers, is an exception to this rule. Between 1969 and 1980, Lopez, known as the Monster of the Andes, is thought to have slain hundreds of people, mostly young girls. 
Pedro Lopez may not be well known to many people outside of the South America, yet in 2006, the Guinness Book of World Records declared him the most prolific serial killer. Due to accusations that it turned killing into a sport, this record was later taken out of the book. Pedro Lopez would likely come out on top if killing were a contest. Not only is he thought to have killed over 450 people, but he also got away with it and is now free. Pedro Lopez may even cross your path today as you stroll down the street. He's still at large, that much is true. Nobody knows the whereabouts or even the existence of this ruthless killer. There's still a chance that Pedro Lopez is still active in killing people worldwide. Number 5. Simeon Mogilevich Simeon Yotkovich Mogilevich, a Russian-Ukrainian mafia leader born in 1946, is regarded as the boss of bosses of most Russian mafia syndicates worldwide. He was accused twice of fraud in breaking the laws governing currency exchange activities in 1973. In 1977, following his release, Mogilevich formed a criminal organization called Train Station in Kiev and made connections with the Lyabertusi and Solensevo Moscow gangs. He founded the Arbot International Business, active in the shipping and export industry in the Perestroika era. Mogilevich relocated to Budapest in 1990 when he established the Sold Savon Gang's International Division. Mogilevich founded YBM Maganax International and FNJ Trade Management, two sizable businesses in the USA. The FBI wants him for allegedly defrauding $150 million from the company's investors between 1993 and 1998 using shares of YBM Maganax International. He was charged with extortion, securities fraud, postal fraud, fraud involving electronic communications, and money laundering. Additionally, Mogilevich was thought to have sold Osama bin Laden's organization enriched uranium. He allegedly sold Iran armored vehicles and ground to air missiles in the early 1990s. Semyon won't take your life because he doesn't find value in your dead body, but he would do what it takes to make all your cash his. What do you prefer, your money or your life? Share your pick and reason in the comment section below. Number 4 Pedro Rodriguez Filo when it comes to Pedro Rodriguez Filo, doing the right thing might be advantageous. For the most part, Rodriguez chose victims who weren't typical everyday individuals. Rodriguez, who was pursued by other criminals and those who had mistreated him, was described by one psychologist as the ideal psychopath. Rodriguez's life had a difficult beginning from the moment he was born. His mother was beaten by his father while pregnant and as a result he was born in 1954 in Minas Gerais, Brazil with a fractured skull. At age 14, Rodriguez killed his first animal. When Rodriguez's father was employed as a school guard, the man recently sacked him for allegedly taking food from the institution. Rodriguez used a shotgun to shoot him in front of the municipal hall. Soon later, he committed his second murder. Rodriguez then killed a second guard who was thought to be the actual food thief. He hid in the Amogi das Cruzes neighborhood of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Pedro Rodriguez Filo killed a drug dealer there after arriving and took part in some burglaries. He also experienced love. Maria Aparecida Olympia was her name, and they shared a home until gang members murdered her. The passing of Olympia sparked Rodriguez's subsequent crime wave. In his quest to discover the gang member who killed Olympia, he hunted down several persons connected to the crime and tortured and killed them. Number 3. Nakula Basili the 55-year-old Mark Basili Yusuf, formerly Nakula Basili Nakula, is expected to appear before U.S. District Judge Court. Yusuf's 2011 prison release came with conditions, one of which prohibited him from adopting aliases without a probation officer's approval. Yusuf, an Egyptian-born man, has been identified as the creator of a 13-minute shoddily produced video shot in California and distributed online under various names, including Innocence of Muslims. Last month, it made fun of the Prophet Muhammad and provoked anti American protests in Egypt and other Muslim nations. The U.S. Marshals Service detained Yusuf on September 27th. On that day, he was brought before a federal judge in a hearing held under heavy security, where prosecutors charged him with breaking the terms of his probation. A federal prison officer later verified he was brought to a high-rise federal jail in downtown Los Angeles after a court ordered him kept without bail that day. The defendant who had experience working in the gas station industry stated at the beginning of his previous hearing that he had changed changed his identity from Nikula Basili Nikula to Mark Basili Yusuf in 2002. The most recent court findings from Friday identify him as Yusuf, although earlier court documents referred to him as Nikula. He most recently resided in a Los Angeles suburb. Number 2. Joseph Coney he was the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army, LRA, 
a militia that terrified northern Uganda and the nations that bordered it in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Twelve counts of crimes against humanity, murder, enslavement, sexual enslavement, rape, and inhuman acts of causing serious bodily injury and suffering, as well as 21 counts of war crimes, murder, cruel treatment of civilians, purposeful targeting of a civilian population for the attack, pillaging, inducing rape, and forced enlistment of children are all alleged to have taken place in northern Uganda after July 1, 2002. The alleged crimes case also concerns Vincent Odi, even though Raska Lukuya and Okat Odiambo were originally involved in the case, legal action against them has been discontinued because they have already passed away. In this particular instance, the arrest warrants were issued secret on July 8, 2005 and were not made public until October 13, 2005. The accused have not been apprehended, even though Raska Lukuya and Okot Odiambo were originally involved in the case, legal action against them has been discontinued because they have already passed away. Number 1. Ismail El Mayo Zambada Ismail Mario Zambada Garcia has long led the Zambada Garcia Foundation of the Sinaloa Cartel. Zambada Garcia is exceptional in that despite being a significant international drug trafficker for his entire adult life, and he has never served a day in prison. Zambada Garcia has been accused in several indictments over the years, including those from the following jurisdictions. The District of Columbia on January 28, 2003. The Northern District of Illinois on August 20, 2009. The Western District of Texas on April 11, 2012. The Southern District of California on July 25, 2014 and the Eastern District of New York on May 11, 2016. Each of the accusations alleges a serious infraction of federal drug laws. Vicente Zambada Niebla, Zambada's son, was also charged in the Northern District of Illinois indictment unsealed in 2009. The following year, Mexican officials detained Zambada Niebla. He was later transferred back to the United States and charged in Chicago at Joaquin Guzman Loera's trial in Brooklyn, New York in January 2019. Zambada Niebla ultimately entered a guilty plea and consented to cooperate, testifying against him. In May 2019, he received a 15-year prison term. Zambada Niebla described how this father, Zambada Garcia and Chapo Guzman, shipped tons of cocaine during his testimony in New York. In addition, he stated that his father regularly spent up to $1 million per month on bribes with money flowing to numerous high-ranking Mexican government officials. Which of these criminals would you rank the most dangerous? Share your reason in the comment section below. Remember to like and share with your friends.